online. And today I have two announcements. The first one is that we are moving to be weekly seminars, meaning that uh, next week we won't have a seminar, but the following one will be the next one. And the second announcement is that uh, Leandro Giacomin is joining as a team of organizers. So we are very glad to welcome him in our team. And also remember that you can always uh, participate in the Soranaisi of the week. You can see in the chat the link to fill in the form and participate and propose a species for the Soranaisi of the week. So then we can promote it in social media, uh, etc. So now I'm going to introduce uh, Tina Sarkinen, our speaker today. And Tina is Finnish by nationality and came to the UK as a university exchange student in 2001. She never planned to stay long term, but she's still living in Scotland. Tina studied in Edinburgh and of her, for her undergrad and master's and in University of Oxford for her doctoral degree. After her PhD in Oxford, she worked in London at the Natural History Museum for three years with Sandy Knapp not on dinosaurs, but on wild, wild potatoes and tomatoes and eggplants. Once she got to know them, she has never looked back and she has fallen in love with the nightshades. Tina has learned to appreciate weeds, species complexes, nothing being just about one character, large groups in general and the difficulties, challenges faced and the complexity of names with synonyms and homonyms. Those names that look the same, but were named by different authors. In 2013, she came back to Edinburgh to start permanent research. Tina runs an international research group with a few PhD students and postdocs and teaches on the Royal Botanical Garden in Edinburgh, a master course on taxonomy and biodiversity of plants. Today, she's going to talk about the monograph monographing the large and genus Solenum. So with that, I let you with Tina and thank you, Tina, for being here today for all of us. You are muted, Tina. Yeah, now back. <laughs> um, I hope the screen is being shared the right way because it keeps yes, switching. It's yeah, perfect. Good. So thank you very much for the invitation. I'm kind of honored to talk amongst the Solanesi um, seminars. Um, the series is a fantastic platform. I really enjoy uh, seeing them when I can. I often teach on Friday afternoons, but catch them up later. Uh, so congratulations and thank yous for those who make it happen. Um, firstly, I feel a bit fake talking about Solanum among such giants as, um, as they are in the audience and have uh, presented in this series. So um, allow me to be uh, naive and youthful and pride-eyed and bushy tail in my approach. Um, uh, there is a lot of work that I'll be presenting that isn't of my doing. So just to acknowledge uh, that a lot of the work um, on Solanum is building on uh, or standing on the shoulders of these giants and many younger giants who've been contributing recently. So there's a lot of people's efforts have gone into what I present. So in no way is it all mine, but rather I present an overview um, of Solanum and uh, really asking the question that's been fascinating me most recently, what can large genera tell us and what do they, what are the rare stories they tell us and what are the generalities they tell us? So the main acknowledgements um, that I'm uh, presenting people's work is Edeline Gagnon, Rebecca Hilgenhoff, Jay Delves, Peter Mulai, and Sandy Knapp. So with, that, uh, with those words straight into it, the biggest, the one thing you got to say straight away when working on Solanum is the size of it. So working on a big genus like Solanum with more than 1,200 species has made me ask myself, what do these large groups really tell us about biology? It's a beast of a genus, beast of a task, trying to understand it and monographing it, looking at tons of specimens due to the weedy nature of many of the species, so whilst doing that with my silent playmates in the herbarium, I wonder what does it really tell us? And how does it, or what we're finding about this one genus, this one big genus, what, how does it relate to the bigger picture? So the genus has more than 2,200 uh, 2, species currently accepted. Uh, it grows um, by approximately nine new species per year. 
um, uh, if we look at the trend over the past 20 years or 30 years, um, and with that trend, we would expect um, 2,500 species, oh, 1,500 species, sorry, the typo, uh, by 2050. So there's a good question. How much are we expecting in this genus? And I wonder what Lynn and Richard and others will comment. Would it be 1,500, not 2,500? Will we break the 1,500 mark? What do we think? But the question I'm going to ask today is, is the genus Selenium usual or unusual? Is it general or special? The patterns we're finding about it, what do we think? So can we apply what we're finding about this genus to plants in general? Firstly, looking at it, before we go any further, I thought if I want to ask this question, does it tell us something general? I need to ask myself at least, is it, is it okay to, to assume that genera are real, i.e. can genera tell us something? Are genera biologically real? Um, or is it just artificial where we break it? So this means that our breaks in the trait space, the morphological trait space, as visualized here by uh, floral um, diversity across selenium. Uh, and are there breaks in phylogenies? In evolutionary biology, species are used as fundamental study units. Um, and um, evolutionary forces like drift or selection and gene flow act within species in the genetic uniformity or phenotypic, uh, phenotypic similarity across populations. What about genera or any higher level units? So there was a fantastic paper by uh, Tim Baraclaw and Ailey's Humphreys in 2015 published in New Phytologist that looked into this in plants. Um, they looked at the evolutionary reality of species and higher taxa in plants. And what they proposed is that there are three possible models to test for this, to test how uh, empirical phylogenies uh, fit into um, expectations. So the first expectation is that there is a continuous hierarchy. There is There are no breaks uh, in morphological trait space, as illustrated in these left-hand side uh, figures, or in the phylogeny, the structure of the phylogeny. Um, this assumes there are no um, higher level real units in biology, whereas the two alternative um, options are is a partial cohesion model that genera are perhaps real. So there's some clustering in the uh, trait space as illustrated here with these blue circles. And in the phylogeny, you see some structuring and hierarchy, but not more than one level. And at the most extreme, there is the full cohesion model as illustrated here now on right, where there are different levels evident in both the morphological trait space and the phylogeny, these green and blue circles. So they tested very conveniently our Solanaceae phylogeny in their paper. So they took the Solanaceae phylogeny as it was one of the most densely sampled at species level for a family or large group, a large enough group and deep enough in evolutionary time. Um, and that was one of the three plant phylogenies they tested these models on. Um, conveniently for us, they found 96 higher level units in a family of currently 102 accepted genera, giving some evidence that yes, indeed, there are some breaks um, in this phylogeny that would reflect higher level units in terms of taxonomy and that they would be real. We could also add two other arguments to this, that perhaps in plants genera are real because higher taxa share evolutionary history. By default, that gives us some opportunity of exploring particular questions. At least they have a shared evolutionary story. And that there's reproductive isolation acting stronger between genera in plants um, that this has been looked at compared to species where species level um, reproductive isolation isn't always um, fulfilled. Assuming for now that we can accept this idea that genera are real and can be, the question can be asked, uh, asked what do they tell us about bi uh, biological or evolutionary questions? Um, so we go back to the question of what do these big genera tell us? 
um, in terms of size alone, alone, solanum cannot be said to be usual. It is unusual. Having more than 1,000 species um, in a genus is rare in plants. And this was nicely demonstrated in a, in, a, uh, in a classic paper in science in 2004 by Robert Scotland and Mike Sanderson, where they looked at various groups, as illustrated here, three plant families and birds. Many genera, most genera are small, in fact, tiny, and only a very few genera are extremely large. So being as large as solanum in plants is a rare thing. And this classic pattern of a hollow curve is known from across organisms. Um, so in that sense, in terms of size, solanum is not usual. On average, plant genera have 21 species, a factoid I, I, I quite embrace. So this is something um, other people working on big genera have asked. So Peter Moonlight in his 2018 paper in Taxon was really curious to know how does Begonia, uh, one of the top big plant genera, compare to other top ranking genera. And he looked at the growth of these genera. Um, he um, took the list by this famous paper by Frodin et al, uh, Frodin himself in 2004, who looked at um, the top big genera and um, Peter Moonlight took these genera and looked at their growth through time. So what we did yesterday, being very enthusiastic about the question, Peter and I looked at the, um, the top genera now. So we revised Frodin's list because big genera change. They are being split, they're being lumped. Who are the big players right now? So we went to World Floor Online the most recent release um, and looked at the number of names and cleaned it up a little bit. So the top players at the moment, they are 22 genera of plants that have more than 1000 species, if you exclude apomictic species um, in groups like uh, Rubus and Taraxicum. So forgetting dandelions and apomixes, this would be the top list. Um, in Freudian's time, in 2004, we knew about 19 genera that were, um, that were as big as this. So it's increasing. The number of big ones is increasing. In Freudian's time, there were two genera that had above 2,000 species, and they are now currently six. So bigger are getting bigger. Uh, the big are getting bit bigger. Um, the other theme that this shows is Solanium is currently ranking number 13. So Solanium is falling down on these ranks, but still amongst the big players. And, and there are some interesting trends of um, many of these groups are herbaceous, if you look at them, and trees are clearly underrepresented amongst these top players. So it gives us a nice overview of what, what the big ones are, who are they and where. Some, most are global, but some are specific to particular co continents or regions. In terms of um, growth, how these uh, groups are growing, these big genera, um, which was Peter's original question, we updated the um, curves of growth in terms of new names being published based on IPNI records since 1990 until today. And in terms of the growth, we can see that they're very different shapes of curves. So to compare solanum, which is highlighted here in orange line, thick orange line, to all the other genera that have more than 1,000 species uh, over the past 30 years, we can see that some of the genera were big in 1990s or were the biggest, like Lepanthes, and was growing faster, but that's now steadying down. Whereas at the moment, over the past 20 years, genera like begonia have been growing very fast, but the biggest players are two um, orchid genera, Meconia, that leaped in, in a single year to, big, uh, to high numbers, and Astragalus and two other orchid genera. They are ones that are creeping up slowly and unexpectedly, and Thurium wasn't on that list uh, to begin with, but is now definitely um, uh, reaching uh, the top ranked list. But then there are 
um, things like selenium and croton that are much more steady and um, stable. They are not fast risers, but steady growers. There's no big drama, there's no big leaps, and steady growth of new names over the past 30 years. But if we look at these new names, we can ask ourselves new names in terms of what? Are they entirely new or are they so-called imported? Is this immigration? So are these names being transferred from other genera or are they simply new names uh, being proposed? And we are now looking at, in the previous graph, we looked at all names. So this includes transfers from other genera. In this graph now, we're looking at just names that are entirely new. I'm, in other words, we're excluding combinations. And what we find is some of these ranks change. So Meconia falls down and it's actually the only one really where the growth has been mainly driven by imports. Obviously, there's still more than 150 names being described over the 30 year time. So that's not nothing. So it is not to say these genera aren't growing at all in terms of new names. It's just that it's proportionately much larger in terms of import in Meconia. So Lanium is mainly new names. Um, there's a lot of synonymy. So the total number in the genus doesn't grow as much, but the new names are not imports, but simply purely new. So that's interesting to us uh, taxonomists. Uh, in, terms, um, in terms of the type of taxonomy that ongo uh, is ongoing in these big genera, I wanted to ask about synonymy. So this is something that is um, difficult to do unless you have access to uh, experts of different groups. So in Edinburgh, we have begonia experts. So Peter Moonlight and I sat down and compared Solanum and begonia. So looking at these two um, genera, in Solanum we have more than 6,000 names and only 1,200 are accepted. That gives us an 80% synonymy rate. In Begonia, and this is not the GBIF data, but this is the Begonia Resource Center data, they have more than 4,000 names and half of them are accepted. So that gives you a 50% synonymy rate. So the rates vary. So the types of taxonomy ongoing in different big genera are likely, at least based on these two, quite different. Um, this fits quite well with known synonymy rates in publications. So Wortley and Scotland in 2004 in Taxon paper looked at synonymy rates across 18 at a time recently published monographs in plants that covered more than 1,500 species and found that synonymy rate in um, plant groups varies from 32% to 88%. So these two genera fit the kind of within the normal range what is being observed but clearly at two extremes. So they are different patterns within these big groups. In terms of evolutionary branches, do big genera, these top players uh, that have more than 1,000 species, do they represent angiosperms? Well, the first thing to know is all 22 genera are angiosperms. So we looked at all seed plants, but um, the top players are all angiosperms. Um, Telipteris, depending on taxonomy, <clears throat> may rank, but um, we accepted the taxonomy that classifies it as a um, genus of two species, not more than 1,000. So obviously there are questions there, but mostly angiosperms. There are two magnolids, so both piperales, two, uh, um, uh, lots of monocots, and a lot of rosids and asteroids in the dicots. What's really interesting is that um, uh, the, the, big, the bigger the order in terms of number of species, the higher likelihood it is to have one big genus at least. So obviously species diversity correlates with having at least one big genus. Um, then we asked, interested, we really got into this yesterday, right? Catherine caught us. The biggest order without big genera, so which order is big in terms of species number but doesn't have a big genus, well, it's sapping dailies. And it's interesting to note they're all woody. So they may be lianas, they may be trees, but they are woody. So is there something in there? The smallest orders with a big genus include piperales with two big genera in a single family, piperaceae. So that is that makes sense. Alismatales, which includes aroids, so that's 
compared to the species diversity in the order, it's unusual to have one big genus. Solanales, so Solanum is exceptional in that case. And Cocobitales, Begonia. So it's good to know you are unique in some sense, unexpected. So it brings us to ask, having considered all these, uh, this variation and uh, unity, what can big genera tell us? Um, it is clear that they are exceptional, which makes them unusual. It is also clear that there are differences between them, which is interesting that it's uh, what makes it usual to be unusual <laughs> is a cool question to ask. But without going too deep into that, I'm going to now focus on the three things that that big genera, I think, can tell us. So one of them is that big genera offer us diverse study systems in terms of species diversity or morphology or other traits or ecology. And this is definitely the case in Solanium. It doesn't provide us hummingbird pollination syndrome, but in terms of traits, it really does provide us vast diversity. Uh, in terms of species diversity, it offers you a chance of looking at multiple tips that all share an evolutionary history and get out of this n equals one sample size is only one issue that many smaller groups or studies based on smaller groups face. So the kind of Arabidopsis problem, studying speciation in Arabidopsis will be challenging no matter what you do. Um, how uh, one argument again here in big genera is that it offers you the, this high diversity with relative high genomic synteny. Obviously this is in relative terms. So these genera do vary in my understanding. Begonia has a lot more, um, a lot less synteny between the species than we know in Solanum. But again, on a relative scale, you would assume synteny being higher between species of um, begonia than between different genera. Um, these big groups also enable nested and comparative studies because they include global scales often. So you could just, uh, uh, you could look at uh, transitions of traits because there's multiple traits, but you could also look at some nested study designs across, uh, across evolutionary depths. So from the crown node to the tips, Solanum spans at least 22 million years, and that's the minimum age estimate for the genus. Um, Solanum and many of these big genera, they cross continents. So again, they offer multiple um, dispersal events or uh, transitions um, that can be used to see what happened over evolution. Um, and perhaps most importantly, some of these big genera are offering us this with a, um, with a, a currently worked on uh, phylogeny, relatively well sampled, taxonomic database with names, as well as taxonomically verified occurrence data sets. And Begonia and Solanum are both actually examples of this. And that gives you a lot. And I'm going to talk about this. So this is an example of in Solanium, us having a lot of morphological data, the key to happiness, which is an example of it. We have great phylogeny, one could argue, with now 60% of species sampled in it, um, in Solanum. And then we have this um, online a taxonomic um, uh, monograph that enables us to uh, keep the data together, but also it is based on uh, taxonomically verified occurrence data that are georeferenced. So first I'm going to look at the Solanium morphology. So this is Rebecca Hilkenhoff's work who uh, started as a master's student and has now worked uh, on Solanium for a few years as a fellow uh, with Sybil fun funding from Edinburgh Botanic Gardens. So um, so um, Rebecca's work uh, has been focused on understanding morphology and across Solanum. And she published these beautiful um, keys, online keys, um, that enable you to firstly take a, a specimen of Solanum and key it to a major group. So to understand which monograph should I open to a non-specialist, or a start and a person in Solanum, this is massive help. 
um, I still struggle knowing certain groups, like separating them, knowing which one is it. And I have used this and found it extremely useful. And if nothing else, it acts as a real database of morphology for us to build upon with strong visual components, which enable you to communicate complex characters with more ease than just words. We have a nice how-to um, guide to, to the key, including test specimens to hone in your, uh, your eye and to practice using our traits, because obviously coming from, for example, Begonia, you may interpret traits or the way we, we verbalize them in Selenium very differently. And we understand that challenge. Um, and you can get to them by just Googling Selenium identification keys. And that takes you to this Solana C source site that gives you the links. Um, so once we now have this key and morphological data recorded and the traits kind of homogenized so that the terminolo terminology matches across clades, um, what can we do with all this? Well, we can start putting these names on these clades. And our hope really is that previously these specimens in Solanum were piling up in herbarium in deck cupboards, waiting for an expert to one day pass by. And hopefully now people can embrace the challenge and find the courage to try with these keys to identify them at least to groups. Um, narrowing down your options from 1,230 possibilities to 10 feels very empowering. So I recommend this for Friday afternoon fun. What are the, the morphological data can also now be used to map these characters across the phylogeny um, and find traits that define clades as well as traits that are evolutionary labile. And this is something we're now working on on a manuscript and with the help of other Solanum specialists, we are trying to steer on a pure path of simplifying complexity without losing the plot. So um, the results from this analysis of mapping traits across the phylogeny at clade level, note, not at species level at this stage, are showing that the traits that define big clades in Solanum and this is no news to most Solanum specialists, include prickles, presence or absence of, trichome structure, mainly driven by presence or absence of stellate trichomes, um, and, and the characters, um, especially to do with and the shape, which makes the biggest divisions. Um, what is interesting about these top, uh, these traits that define clades is leaf division is quite surprisingly conserved across Solanum. Um, in other groups uh, like uh, geraniums, we know it's highly evolving and begonias, um, if I've understood correctly. In Solanum, we don't find that level of craziness and there is structure to the trait across the phylogeny. There's also interesting um, patterns, I would argue, that would be worth proposing to developmental audience uh, with our results, whether you can see um, differences in the pathway from lobed, uh, from simple to um, compound leaves directly or with this um, intermediate step of lobing. But without uh, be, uh, zooming straight into individual traits, just to provide the overview that there are clear traits that define clades, um, and most of it isn't surprising, but it's nice to be able to quantify these traits finally uh, with a better sampling. Uh, prickles, as I said, very much defines a big uh, group. Um, there are groups outside Leptostomonum that have them, and they are not potentially just a single um, origin, but prickles are derived from stellates, stellate hairs. And the horns are example of anthem modifications. Um, they are exclusive to Normania clade, um, as shown here in the image. They're quite funky little structures. And the appendages that are fused at the top occur in tomato clay, but this is for you, Lynn. Solanum craveolens, would we not say, so we are struggling putting these um, uh, exceptional species um, like craveolens into lumping or not lumping, calling the craveolens extension something different or not, so-called first step homology assessment. Um, they are quite similar. They're not visualized here. The pictures we have of that species are quite poor, but um, the question remains how to place um, these um, craveolins uh, extensions in relation to tomato plates or something I'll be asking Lynn's views. 
but it's still we're struggling with making these um, putting things into boxes or separating them when needed. Um, Chordate anthers is a very unique feature of a single lineage that sits between the generally non-chordate clade one members that are the elongates, very uh, potato tomato like anthers, and then the rest, the leptostomonum that has tapered anthers. This chordate species occurs in Peru, it's called Solanum anomalostemon, quite fittingly. Um, storage organs have evolved at least four times independently. Um, they are not homologous, so in the Regmandroclade, they are, um, uh, it's a swollen cordex, um, but it's storing carbo complex carbohydrates, most likely the way it looks and acts, compared to the true tubers in three other clades. Um, and these are useful in defining clades. But many clades are not, uh, not possible to identify based on a single trait, so-called single silver. You really need a combination of, like here exemplified by the geminated clade. You can tell it by eye. You can train. Lynn was able to train me before I even started my postdoc in telling clades in the uh, in herbarium uh, in Solanum. But verbalizing those differences is a challenge, um, and doing it in a key successfully is a challenge. So hopefully these multi-axis keys are helping and our definitions of these traits and clades um, in the future publications that are now in preparation. Then the question is, what is evolutionary label? What is not useful in defining these major or minor clades in Solanum? And they are the four top traits that are really not useful, either uh, extremely labile across clades, and that is growth form and sympodial units, which are both to do with plant structure in solanum, and uh, presence of glandular tips on trichomes, either stellate trichomes can have glandular tips or simple, and we simply analyze the presence or absence of glandular tips, and that switches on and off, on and off all the time across clades and within clades. Fruit color is another one. So these Top four um, are nicely in contrast to those that are evolutionary conserved. Again, this growth form um, uh, ranking high at the top is not perhaps a surprise to many solanum specialists, but it is nice to be able to quantify and um, visualize it to, to start comparing to other big genera. For example, Euphorbia is famously known as being a big genus and um, highly labeled in terms of growth form. There were four traits that, um, that are slightly different in between these two categories. So they are indicating indicated to be conserved at clade level compared to null models. So they have less switching than you would assume. So less shifts or transitions across the clade level phylogeny than expected by chance, but they have extremely high polymorphs polymorphisms at the tips. So most clades are not fixed, but show at least presence of one to two to three states. Um, that indicates that there's a lot going on at the tip level in evolution, but not much between clades. And that in itself is interesting. These uh, traits relate to inflorescence structure. So the inflorescence position and branching, crawler shape and color. And this is, um, something I'm passionate in exploring more because you look at selenium flowers, you first think they have all these particular um, form of um, five-parted flowers with an anthocone, but looking at this diversity, that description doesn't quite fit, right? So there's a lot of variation there that would be nice to tease apart with um, more quant um, a quantifiable traits rather than categorical traits. So this is something that we're wanting to explore with master students and projects um, in terms of corolla and um, stamen and uh, stamen characters, filament and anther length and size and, and positioning. Corolla color will be more challenging just because color is hard to, hard to quantify. New traits are still um, being found. So Solanum fernandesii from the Gardneri clade in the spiny solanums has these very peculiar glands on the petioles. So here you would see these glands, but obviously this picture doesn't allow you to zoom in. So it's a small herbaceous plant with these glands and they were thought to be extra floral nectaries most likely. 
And there was a beautiful uh, detail uh, study by Silva Sampaio et al, uh, led by Italo Coutinho's group in uh, northeast Brazil. And they did field studies and really looked at um, whether these glands were visited by insects or, um, or anything else, what was going on. They did not find any observations of insect visitations, but what they did, um, they were able to look at it anatomically, um, finding that the structure is uh, made out of uh, densely clustered trichomes that have uh, two cell glandular uh, tips and that what these glands contain, uh, or these trichomes in them, uh, is more representative of these uh, organs being petal or resin glands, rather, or these structures being resin glands, rather than extra floral nectaries. And that is because they lack sugars and they contain instead polysaccharides, pectins, mucilage, proteins, lipids, essential oils, resins, and phenolic compounds based on histological stainings. So really nice natural history is being found and discovered in this group with careful observations. Um, and it's nice to see um, what next. In terms of the phylogenetic work, really to summarize it, and this is based on Eleline Cagnon's work, uh, here pictured with a legume, um, we have passion for all sorts of groups. Um, the phylogeny of selenium based on Sanger sequence data presents the best opportunity to have dense species level sampling. So the Sanger phylogeny now includes 742 species of selenium, which is 60% of the whole genus. And what we wanted to do is keep piling this up whilst looking at nuclear and plastome phylogenomic data. And what the data from these genomic level studies is showing is that the clades themselves are stable which is really nice. So clades are becoming stable. They are robust uh, with more genomic level data um, from both genomes. But what is unstable is their relationships. And the question remains why? And so to uh, summarize it slightly, so what our data is able to look at is the relationship between these major clades, nothing further in the spines, and what the phylogenomic um, analysis. So on the left, we see nuclear data based on the angiosperm beta sets. And on the right, we see um, the supermatrix Sanger tree compared to the plastome phylogenomic data. Um, the real true comparison we're interested in right now is these ones. So the nuclear plastome discordance, which is highlighted by these red broken lines. So the position, the identity of potato is not in question. We get strong support for the clade of potato, but we don't know how it relates to the other um, clades that have been previously placed in grade one. So the relationship between potato, dulcomeroids and moreloids, here referred to as dulmo, recmandra, this fascinating group with um, the swollen cortex in one species from the Atacama Desert along Peruvian coast, and vanans, which includes various small clades, um, lesser known non-spiny. Um, and the telopodian group always turns up as sister to the rest of selenium. So again, that is not in question, but it's the relationship of, of these, um, these grade one members, as we refer to them. Uh, similar issues may turn up in the spinies, but we'll need more phylogenomic sampling to explore those questions. So we now know that the uh, clades will be, um, are useful uh, in selenium. And we can hold on to them and perhaps formalize them even. And I'll come to that when talking about the taxonomy. But the relationships in terms of evolutionary history will be, um, remain unclear because these look like hard polytomies, as indicated here with the red line and broken black line. So selenium taxonomy work has been led much by Sandy and a ton of selenium experts from across the world. And I'll summarize um, some of that work and, um, and our current work in that uh, here. Um, all of that is being um, uh, projected into the wider world in the online monograph of Solani Sea Source. So in this one single website, you can access most of it, whether it's been published or whether it's about to be published or whether um, it is work that just never made it to a publication. It is included here on the website. So it's the one single source to quote. 
um, this is the Solanum Expert Network with squished faces. So there's a lot of use in the audience in there. And just to say thank you to everybody who's uh, happily contributing data so that data from individual projects, whether they are masters, undergraduate, uh, postdocs, they end up in a single storage system because these are taxonomically verified specimens at the end of the day, different to harvesting data from online uh, without knowing who's put the name on it. Um, our data set currently includes over 100,000 collection events um, based on many, many more specimens. So these are collection events from across over 400 herbaria and nearly half of it is georeferenced. And we contributed to different um, online aggregators like World for Online um, uh, when people approach us. Um, Oh, it's having a moment again. Apologies. We're thinking here, whether it's crashing or not. So just whilst it's thinking, uh, to talk about what that database or what the online um, website provides is um, is uh, species descriptions. So there are more than um, 900 species descriptions of sol uh, solanum now available, which is phenomenal. Um, and it's worth using it as an as a online resource. The website is hard to search. It's not the most user-friendly, but it has a lot of bonus points, a lot of plus features. So you can put a species name there, click taxonomy and click search. You can't press enter, annoying, we know. There's a lot of names being treated across the family, but in Solanum, um, it helps you to understand synonymy uh, and accepted names. There's photographs for the species provided if they are available, um, and it allows you to look at distribution maps and specimens as well and download the data, but best to get in touch with us to get the most updated data. And the identification keys are linked there too. Um, this is an um, overview of what you would find if you search for name, you get pictures of it and you can then go to a description, which is extremely helpful rather than having to find a book or a PDF and the maps and specimens are available. Um, it's thinking again. Uh, and here you would start getting into the full description and these are parallel, which is amazing uh, resource for that many species in a big genus. And the map overview is really nice and zoomable and again, can contrast GBIF data compared to the taxonomically verified data, which is a very nice feature, I recommend. Um, oodles of fun to understand how dirty are or clear the data out there is. The date, that website is based on this mothership, as we call it. It's a database and this is how it looks. Just nice to see um, how the car looks under the bonnet. And um, the data comes from several different herbaria and details of barcodes and so on, or, uh, notes on them are there. And this is building on several decades of work. And what I'm gonna show now is one a master student based in Edinburgh who explored the biases in these kind of specialist data sets compared to publicly available data when the computer is happy. Don't know what's going on here. And the work I'll be presenting is work of Jay Delves, um, looking at um, a Solanaceae source data, focused on Solanum data we have for Peruvian species. So she took all species that occur in Peru, looking at the number of herbarium specimens and the number of herbaria they came from. And she found that in Solanaceae source, 40% of the data of species that occur in Peru come from um, Peruvian herbaria in our database and 60% from international herbaria. So if I have a duplicate, for example, in Edinburgh of a specimen that I collected in Peru, it would turn up in both. But if there's a specimen only in Peru, um, then it would only contribute to this blue pie here of a Peruvian species. However, if you compare this to GBIF data for Solanum, for the Peruvian species, it is in stark contrast. If you go to publicly available databases, the data from biodiverse country for its 
phone diversity is tiny. In the case of Peru, so we're just looking at tropical Andean country. So this may be different for other geographical areas, but for the tropical Andes, that contrast between 1% and 43. So if you take this as reality, let's say, and we have been to most Peruvian local herbaria and database most selenium specimens, so this could still be an absolute underestimate. But given, let's just assume that this is somewhat representative of reality. That means that when we're looking at the global data provider or harvesting tools, we're really missing a lot of useful data. Well, the question is, how useful would that be? What are we missing? That was her second question. So she took that. And now we wait. She took the data and um, compared them. So here's the, all the data for Peru. And uh, it is showing the number of specimen per crit cell. So we see a bias towards the Andes, we see some data gaps, but overall, there's at least one specimen from a lot of these areas, and some are real peaks. If you take out the Peruvian herbaria of this data, this is how the world looks like, right? So if you go to GBIF, you would see this map, diversity map. This is just number of specimens, right? We're not looking at species diversity. The way she then quantified the effect of the loss of this, so if you have no proven her barrier, um, so she took proven data out, which removed nine her barrier that we had data for. We lost 10,000 specimens, so lost in the sense of we were just testing the effect of not seeing uh, these her barrier. We lost data for 12 species completely. So for these 12 species, we only have data from Peruvian herbari. For 26 species, the IUCN threat assessment, or in other words, strongly correlated with range size, uh, changed dramatically. Um, so 26 species were considered threatened when they actually are not. So if we do not look at this data, if we do not have access to it, if we don't know it exists, we will be overestimating, quite high overestimation of rarity of range size. And that to me is just, I just really find that astonishing. So there's a lot of data out there that isn't digitally available. We knew that, but lucky we are having it in our Solenium database for some countries. So these, we have no reason to suspect these are particular patterns to Solenium. We tested the pattern on Begonia very same pattern, extremely similar levels, if not stronger. In Begonia, it was slightly higher overestimation of 11%. We would not expect these patterns to be the same geographically across the world, so different country, different pattern perhaps, but worthy of note. This to me means that, um, that if there's a major bias in globally available data, uh, in not including herbarium data from biodiverse countries. And that affects our conclusion. If you use that globally available data or freely available data, it will affect our ability to estimate um, um, range sizes, for example, massively. So what next in Solanum? So things I'm pondering about or working on, the new infragenetic classification based on informally named clade is something um, that's happening and is great to do to provide an overview and summary of currently current best knowledge right now. Um, in Solanum, um, the formally named ranks, um, the infragenetic ranks um, or names haven't been used since Lynn uh, developed this clade naming in 2005 uh, because the clade names work really well. The previous um, sections and subgenera have been used in a confusing way and different ways by different authors. There's a lot of those systems and they're very messy and some systems only apply to part of the genus. So in many ways, um, I guess to only represent myself, it seems more logical to move slowly forward to perhaps phylocode level definition of clades 
to formalize these informally named clades that way than ever revise those sections and subgenera, but use uh, welcome ideas um, because it's working well. New clades still turn up, so not to say new lineages and groups aren't popping up. Astroforum and In Ornatum to me are phenomenal um, stories, how they were completely, well, completely unknown uh, in terms of phylogenetic lineages. To me, what's puzzling about is um, these uh, unassigned floaters. So there are some names that, that we just simply don't know what they are because they are not known for many herbarium specimens. Um, that's one group. But then there are others that we understand the species, but the sequence data isn't that robust. So we have Sanger sequence data. Um, it's not great. It doesn't have a strong signal. In many cases, the nuclear data based mostly on WAXI, a single low copy nuclear marker, and or ITS gives one um, not well supported position. And then plastic data gives another position, but again, not well supported. So phylogenomic data is clearly needed. We don't have it yet. And placing these floaters or singletons, as I call them, so solanum animalostemon, morphologically quite distinct, unique, strange combination of traits, and we don't quite know where it sits. So these will be really interesting. Again, in some cases, that means exploring in the field, getting more herbarium specimens or seed to do full genomes, for example. And we've been focusing on doing that for some of these lineages over the past year in Peru. And Paul Gonzalez in, is in the audience. He's been hunting these, uh, trying to find them in seed. Um, so in conclusion, just to kind of wrap up, genus, um, genera that are big like selenium are unusual and selenium is unusually big um and but, but perhaps it's usual amongst the unusuals to be to be looked at i really think that question is interesting and worth exploring uh, for those who work on big genera or are using them for questions um what it's definitely providing us is a diverse study system that gives n equals bigger than one uh, so many transitions many um uh, many shifts in traits. It gives us a global extent um, and that is worth of something. So you can test patterns across continents and so on or identify differences. It's useful in studies exploring broad scale questions. It doesn't often matter what, but as we're looking um, the bias in data in uh, hotspots like Peru, those ones, it's um, perfectly adequate for and so it's general in many ways because it is large data set with a single origin and single like relatively controlled people who are generating it a bit like a controlled lab setting um, the in, um, data entry is somewhat homogenized but to finish with the beautiful saying that selenium is special in having having uh, this uh, three different data sources. So I would argue not many groups have that yet. I, it's getting there um, and, and new um, systems are enabling it. So legumes are building stuff with GBIF, but legumes didn't have before a um, taxonomically verified uh, occurrence data set. And that can hinder a lot of work or make it more cumbersome. In Solanum, we now have it. Obviously we keep working on it, we keep cleaning it and there are gaps. Um, and that's where we're at, just making it even better and trying to use it for questions. Um, and to say it's, a, it's um, really thanks to a lot of people and here to name many of them. Um, so it's, it represents these people's work. There's uh, David Spooner, Maria Voronsova and so forth. So just to say thanks to all of the people whose data we are looking at um, and uh, to name the most um, actively involved people on the key and morphology work um, who've been really contributing to uh, teaching us naive bunnies um, a trick or two. So thank you very much. Happy to have questions. Thank you, Tina. That was a great talk and such a diverse group. So it has been amazing to hear about uh, the trip that you have undertaken all this big genera. So let's see. Well, Richard said was saying, yay, file code. And somebody <laughs> was saying, yes, it's the way to go with this level of classification. 
I thought that's what um, Richard might say. <laughs> yeah. Then we have Lynn Boss. Uh, she said that she has some comments and questions. Hello, everyone. Um, first, I want to say this was a fantastic, thought provoking talk, Tina, with the most amazing, beautiful pictures, especially of selenium flowers. Um, I just have a few things to say before I forget. This is kind of just for Tina. Selenium graviolans, anthers, um, yeah, they're really weird and I'll check on them and get back to you. Yeah, but there's some pictures on Solanaceae sauce, have a look, but they're not fantastic quality, but maybe you've seen it even in the field. Yeah, I've seen this plant in the field. And so, right. I'll, yeah. Where we would need, you put it? We yeah. need to figure this one out. Yeah. Um, but they're not, they're not like tomato. So, no. yeah. Okay. Um, second comment is about the synonymy uh, rate in selenium versus begonia. And that's very interesting to investigate in these big genera, because of course, the number of species, you know, depends on the number of names and how well, well those names have been vetted. And the, the pattern that I think, and Sandy can maybe com comment on this, the pattern that I see in selenium is the economically important species and the really weedy species just have a ton of synonymy. And maybe that's why we get a different, uh, you know, proportion of synonymy in begonia versus selenium because, you know, there are fewer really economically important species. And I think that's, that's driving a lot of the synonymy. Uh, a third comment is, I just want to emphasize to all of you, and Tina talked about this too, about our community and how collaborative the Solanaceae systematists have been throughout my career. I started my career with Dick and went to his lab and learned how to do molecular techniques. And we've you know, been friends and, and colleagues ever since. And same to the old guard and the new people. We, we just all have a remarkable and amazing community that works together and shares data and goes in the field and we're friends and colleagues. And over my entire career, I'm just, blown away by how great that is, because not all plant groups have that. And by that collaborative spirit, we've been able to advance the systematics of selenium and selenaceae. And now we're at this point where we just have an awesome amount of data. And you know we've just rocketed into space with that. So thank you, everyone. And it's just been a delight to have a career like this and work with you guys. Okay, and then the last thing is the question of, will we get 266 more new selenium species by 2050? <laughs> yeah, what I do you like, think? Well, I, I can only say maybe. That's a lot. It's yeah. almost, you know, it's, it's almost 300 new selenums and, and that's gonna be a lot to find. Yeah. We're gonna find more geminatus and we're gonna describe more spinies. But whether we get to, to get to fifteen hundred, I'm not sure. What do you think, Tina? I don't. I said once. What did I say that I can imagine two more hundred? But really, where where would they come from? Yeah, I don't. Like, what's okay. the total number? Not even like twenty by twenty fifty. More like, what is the total number? Would it be bigger than plus two hundred? Like, would it be bigger than thousand four hundred? Maybe. What's, what's missing? It's, it's yeah. possible. But, but it wouldn't not but, completely yeah. a no-brainer, I would say. Eric says he's, he has some. Yeah, anarachomnum. We don't know much about that. The sarthrum, maybe one or two. There's yeah. A, the Richard uh -huh. Balvin is looking at it in Peru right now, putting names on it. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in Colombia that probably, you know, geminators and stuff that need to be worked on. So I'd like to hear people's take on that. Thank you. I got to comment that, Lynn, I think what makes it such a good group at the moment is the ability of you who've seen a lot of it to have patience with youngsters too, because it's not, it can't be easy. <laughs> People coming into the scene and going, oh, I, I want to do this and this and this. And like the, the kind of flexibility or understanding of that from in my time has been really nice. I appreciate that.
Oh my gosh, I'm so jazzed to have all the new people who are carrying on this work because I'm getting to be an old lady now and um, this is just fantastic. Thank you, Lynn. Then we have uh, Katherine Kidner that has her hand up. Hiya, I just have a question about the whole strangeness of things that are big genera. So do you think that Solanum is big because it's a really successful way of being a plant, spreads all over the place and allopatrically tends to break up into different species? So it's big because it's a it's a successful sort of type. Or do you think there's something endogenous about the biology of Solanum that is running like a speciation engine and causing it to throw off a lot of species in a way that's unusual for a type of plant? I'd like to, like to hear people's views, but in some sense, if you ask people's views what Solanum is about, they would mention the word weedy quite soon, right? Because we know it from the crops. Is it a fair representation? Compared to begonia, yes, I would say begonias. I always think they're the princesses, the kind of more microhabitat specialists. You know, I know some total demon begonias. That, that right, but they like all of all of the ones in neotropics. They're restricted. All of the ones in Peru are restricted to neotropics. None of them are global weeds. That okay. shocked me in begonia. In Solanum, you can name quite many global weeds that also grow in Peru. So it was quite interesting looking at it comparatively working with another big genus um so i guess it's weedy so i would just comment for the sake of getting the debate started maybe they're just good at getting to places and then speciating allopatrically mm -hmm. but yeah maybe richard has comments on that <laughs> before okay you can go uh, richard then there is another question from luz miguel rivera <clears throat> Well, I would just echo what um, Lynn had said about what a great community this is. <clears throat> it's in my long career, which will, as an uh, active uh, faculty member, will be over the next time we meet. So I retire at the end of January. Um, will be uh, I, I have never had a grant to study Solanaceae, but uh, except for my as a postdoc, that was the subject of some of my postdoc research. But uh, it's all been stuff that's the momentum is carried forward because of so many great collaborations primarily it's not uh it, it has sort of never been the central focus of my research since my postdoc years but it's been uh, it's hard to not want to keep working on this group because there are so many great people to collaborate with um i would say as a just a point um of interest is that in 1999 i was invited to participate in a symposium in the South African uh, plant system or just Society of Systematics conference that was devoted to uh, large genera. And the overriding question that everybody was asked was, what is it, you know, what makes genera large genera? And um, my take on it was that large genera tend to be genera that have a really distinctive trait of some sort and are nested within another larger clade that also has a distinctive identity. And so uh, where, what rank would they be assigned at? They get to be assigned at genera. And so everything above the species, and one could argue even at the species level, things are arbitrary. So there needs to be some uh, objective uh, point of comparison. And really, I think the only one that is justifiable is age. It can't be trait, it can't be uh, how many species, period, because you could, if somebody were to say Solanaceae was a genus, it would be the largest genus of all, right? Um, so there's got to be uh, some objective basis. And, and I think that now that we, and in 1999, there were very few good dated trees, but now there are. And I think we see things like Solanum, which has half the family of Solanaceae, and it's a, it's sort of a, a terminal tip on the whole family tree. So it, it you could definitely make the case that there's something going on there that is um, distinctive for this large genus. It's not just a clade that we happen to recognize by a trait. Um, 
So, you know, I, I'm not a believer in the identity, in, in the, the reality of taxa. I think that what there is reality of is monophyletic groups. And so, you know, however we choose to do comparisons, if it's not a direct sister comparison, there has to be some objective uh, basis that's uh, taken into account. And in that barrel claw paper, I think that when he was identifying those units, they weren't all equivalent to genera, right? I mean, they were ob objectively trying to define them on the basis of the phylogeny. And yeah. so, you know, some were genera, some may have been above or below. Yeah. Genus. And the problem, I think uh, selenium would have been a problem. Yeah. Yes. And, and when I, you know, when I talk to people about the, the benefit of going away from rank-based classification, and who know Solanaceae, I'll often ask them the question, well, what other large uh, clades are there in Solanaceae besides Solanum? And they'll think, oh, maybe Nicotiana or maybe Lysianthes or something like that. And I say, what about Solanoidae? That's a huge clade, right? Or what about uh, um, uh, the spiny Solanums? Uh, that's a huge clade. But people don't think about taxa that are not at the rank of a certain few ordinal nodes like genus, family, or order, because that's what we, we especially my generation, have been trained to think about. And as soon as we can get away from thinking about uh, having our thinking being constrained by ranks, uh, the better we'll be for uh, being able to communicate and to assess biodiversity. So that's, I'll get off my soapbox now and let somebody else. But I don't know the species taxonomy of Solanum anywhere near as well as many of you on this call. And uh, so it's, you know, I'm fascinated by all the work that's going on that shows that there are new species continually being found, but I have no answer to your question of how many will we eventually end up mm, with. Yeah. I realize, Catherine, one um, additive um, point to your question about us Arsolanum weedy, and that's why it's successful uh, in speciating, is that when we looked at range sizes in Solanum versus Begonia, they are completely different magnitude of order in Solanum compared to Begonia. So in that sense, there's an evidence of weediness. They, they range sizes are bigger. They get to places, and the more you get to places, the more you have chance of allopatric species, you could argue, right? Or peripatric somehow. So I guess... Would that be a way of looking at it? Because how, how would you look at that question? But I'll poke your brain later, Catherine, because, yeah, we're thinking about this comparing big genera thing. Thank you, Catherine and Richard. So we have a, another question from Luis Miguel Riveros. He says, great talk. I would like to know if there is no doubt that Haltomata is a sister genera solenum, and also how much of next generation sequences have you done for Solanum? And if you are going to focus on these techniques in the future? Good question. So we definitely know Haltomata is the sister. I don't think there's any, any hint of doubt. Um, fascinating group, not tiny. So in some big genera, you have this tiny sister group like Hildebrandia in Begonia. But in Solanum, the sister group is BCO. So there's, is, is it roughly 200 species of Haltomatas? They're really phenomenally interesting in terms of pollination, the floral morphology, the nectary, nectars being differently colored, wowsies. Um, so there's no lack of diversity there, but uh, it's the sister. Uh, the phylogenomic sequencing in selenium hasn't been extensive. It's been strategic in that the little we've done is across the major clades. So not the minor clades, but the major clades. Um, so we, for example, included Solanum anomalostemon because it's a weird lineage in between the major clades. So we wanted to cover that. We definitely want to go bigger that way. So Brigitte Melkor Castro, who is in the audience, is a PhD student working on Solanum torva clade. Um, and that's needing to be monographed is very complex, but... Um, part of her work is going to do molecular sequencing and we'll add, probably add a few odd selenums as well as species from torvoclade. Um, so we are going next gen only going forward. Um, but as we've spoken at Royal Botanic Gardens, sometimes supervising a short term master's project means that we might run next gen sequencing, but then just use few few regions from that for analysis to simplify it. 
to make them doable. So in terms of managing students and stuff, and um, we don't have a lot of money to sequence, but we have samples. So if anybody ever needs to sequence stuff, do get in touch. You might have the right samples with the right name with a voucher, which is important. Thank you, Tina. Then there is a question of Federico Roda, uh, and a lot of congratulations, of course, in the middle. <laughs> Federico, are you there? Yes. No, I was just wondering if one of these things that might make uh, Solan very diverse might be boss pollination. I do think. I, I'd love to explore that diversity of anthers and crawlers and, and stamens in general in Solan and more to really start understanding from the plant side how much is there variation in the parts that are to do with pollination by buzzing insects. So they're not all buzzing uh, bees, they can be other insects that do buzz pollination. How much we know about that in Solanum? Not so much. Um, so Mario's work, Mario Vallejo Marin, who looks at it from the little bit on the plant side, but as well as the insect side. Um, from my point of view, I'd love to just keep looking at it from the plant side strictly. Um, absolutely. I think it'll be interesting to see, is there some specificity, at least from the plant side? So because sister species often have different lengths of filaments versus anthers or the ratios, at least in some clades, like moraloid clade. Different maybe in cyphermandra where there's other stuff happening in the anthers. But I think as a natural historian, it looks like there's something going on between species in Solanum in terms of anthers differentiating, uh, which would give a hint. But... How specific is it from the uh, insect side of things? I don't know. Uh, sorry, and, and the other is, is it's about the trichomes. And it's, well, uh, well, that's maybe more about the Solanis, but it's, you, you found these two types of trichomes, one which is very labile, the glandular ones, and the stellate ones, which are very uh, phylogenetically informative. Uh, <laughs> Do you think that these two have kind of different ecological pressures of uh, genetic basis or what is their importance uh, maybe ecologically or evolutionarily? So I think it's a really big question and we don't have answers, but what I can provide is my kind of um, basic linking to uh, published literature. So the, glan the glandular character, so we're looking at hairs in two different ways. So they are not always like, we're splitting the continuous variation in different ways. So in the structure of the trichome analysis, we looked at is the trichome simple or branched? And if it's branched, is it stellately branched or is it uh, dendritic? And that is phylogenetically conserved. Uh, dendritic hairs only occur in some clades. They never co-occur with stellate hairs. So you're either stellate or dendritic in a clade. You can't have both, which is quite interesting. Mm. So to answer that one. Um, do they have ecological role? I wonder, I've wondered that in terms of the stellate trichomes, um, but there's, to my knowledge, no evidence of anything in published literature against herbivory or something, or pathogens like fungal or umai seeds on the leaf, who knows, but I'd like to know. Um, to me, it's a good question as a natural historian to ask. In terms of glandular hairs, there's a lot of research in tomato clade. So looking at the substances you find in tomato glandular hairs, there's different, many different types of glandular hairs, and we lumped everything into single category. Mm -hmm. So we simply looked at, is there a glandular tip on a trichome, independent of the structure? If you analyze it that way, you find it switches on and off. So there's clear, that to me is interesting, and I think it's nice to analyze it that way. However, different glandular different structured glandular hairs to have different substances in them, in the tomato clade. So that indicates that we may be lumping biologically very different functions. So some have um, compounds that are to do with resistance towards um, uh, eating insects. Others have things that the function isn't quite known in the tomato clade, in my understanding. So, um, Yes, we are lumping things, but we also, for the first time, looking at it broad enough to start seeing some trends. So it's the funny way in these studies, we really struggle, Lynn knows this, how to lump 
and separate these traits because there is a lot of homology issues but we okay, could analyze the trait in different ways sorry thank you i just put a paper there about the haltomata question because we are having some preliminary results that indicate uh, we are finding it uh, kind of sister to Lysiantes capsicum, but I know it has been kind of accepted. This paper of the genome said that they also found some incongruencies, but well, it's just, yeah, just a, a small comment. And maybe our preliminary results will change once we do it properly. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much. It was a great talk, Tina. Thank Thanks. you. Fascinating. Thank you, Federico. Thank you, Fede. Um, I'm going to jump to another question of Shay Goldberg about these trichomes and um, saying that could be, uh, could they be UV protective? Oh. Right. Some of the substance, you mean the actual trichome or the glandular presence of I glandular? Was, uh, the, uh, the stellate ones, the branched ones. The stellate ones generally occur, I mean, I'm speculating here, but high up in the Andes, I don't know many at the very high, like let's say above 4,000 meter elevation in the Andes, tropical Andes, I don't know many species with stellate hairs. I've got to say there's a bias, but this is me based on my experience. So things are biased always. That's interesting. So that would indicate high UV in those environments, but no stellate hair taxa. Branched hairs do occur at that elevation, not, all species at that elevation have branched hairs, but some do. So for what it's worth, an observation from natural history, but doesn't really prove a pattern or lack of. Um, many of them are in hot environments or dry. The still hair taxa, would you say? Not all of them again. Have never thought about it, but could be. I thought UV protection from the glands, but mm, it's one minute. So I think that's, known some of the compounds in those glandular exudates can be uv protective but uh i was just wondering like structurally maybe yeah right yeah does anybody know a paper published on role of stellar hairs in other groups like croton has a lot of diversity of trichomes or catherine there's a brassicaceae paper showing it did actually deter um I think it was aphids from walking around on the leaves. They had a glabrous and a non glabrous variety of um, one of the sort of crop brassicas. And uh, yeah, stop. Brassicas stop have stellate hairs, wowsies. Pardon? Yeah. Do brassicas have stellate hairs? That's lovely. Yeah. Well, I don't Aren't. know. You call them in the Rabidopsis, <laughs> yeah. but I don't yeah. know whether it's properly uh -huh. similar to the Solnacy one. But yeah, branched. Nice. Thank you. So we have one last comment and question from Paul Gonzalez. He says, uh, he comments, what will be the solanaceae with solanum? And how much does this mega diverse genera influence the diversity of each family? You ha have you done the exercise of ranking families by removing this mega diverse genera? No. So what was the beginning of the question? Say that again. Oh yes, how much does uh, this mega diverse, uh, do this mega diverse genera influence the diversity of each family? Yeah, good question. So there was, uh, it's a really good question. So what we did find is that the species diversity in an order has a strong correlation to having a single big genus. So that isn't exactly looking at what you're asking, Paul, but there is an indication that the more species you have in an order, you're likely to have a big genus. But we didn't look at that at family level, but we could. Um, there are exceptions like Piperaceae. So Piperaceae is mainly made out of two extremely large genera. So that's a clear exception to the rule suggested. Um, so it, I don't think there's going to be a single rule, but there are some trends in the top big genera. And again, we are artificially cutting off at anything bigger than 1,000. One could go a bit beyond and to see if there are any trend lines. But yeah, good question. We could easily look at that, Paul. There is non-independence there that makes that sort of a comparison. Yeah, all right. Yeah. Questionable, right? <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Tina. I think that was the last question. 
So with that, we are finishing the seminar. Thank you again. That was a great talk. There is a lot of congratulations in the chat. And well, in two weeks, we have another seminar offline. And in that case, it's going to be Marco Anguiano Constante from Mexico presenting about the biogeography of Lisiantes in Mexico. So thank you, everyone, and see you in two weeks. Thank you. Bye.